You're going to give a keynote. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and uh, welcome to Commonwealth Conversations. Um, this is the northeast portion of our listening tour. Um, my name is Eileen Donahue. I am the senator for the 1st Middlesex District, which includes the city of Lowell, as well as the towns of Dunstable, Pepperell, Tingsboro, Groton, and Westford. Uh, and so I'm honored to have all of you here today. Uh, this is and I'll let uh, my colleague explain more to you about what we're doing around the state. But thank you for coming to this town hall tonight. Um, I would like to take a moment to introduce to you my colleagues, and I'm going to give them a chance to come in and sit down. <laughs> but I'm going to start on my far right uh, and, and introduce to you members of the Massachusetts Senate who are here tonight. To the, my far right, um, we have Senator Michael Barrett from the uh, town of Lexington. <laughs> Sitting next to Senator Barrett is Senator Jason Lewis from the town of Winchester. <laughs> next to Senator Lewis is Senator Barbara Italian from the town of Andover. We have next to Senator Italian, uh, Senator Mark Pacheco from the, the city of Taunton. <laughs> next, and you will hear from him in a moment, we have the Senate President, Stan Rosenberg, all the way from Amherst, Massachusetts. <laughs> to my right, and uh, the, the creator of this idea of having Commonwealth Conversations, uh, my good friend, Senator Mike Rodericks from the town of Westport. <laughs> to my left is the Senate Minority Leader, Senator Bruce Tarr from Gloucester, Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> Next we have from the city of Everett, Senator Sal D. Domenico. We have with us tonight Senator Jamie Eldridge from the town of Acton. <laughs> Next, we have Senator John Keenan from the city of Quincy. I hope I said that right. And last but certainly not least, we have with us from the town, the city of Newburyport, Senator Katie O'Connor Ives. So I am going to turn this over um, now to Chancellor, our host, uh, our gracious host here. We are delighted to be at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, and we are also doubly delighted to have Chancellor Jacqueline Maloney here with us. Chancellor Maloney. Thank you, Senator Donahue, and it is absolutely my honor and privilege to welcome you all to the University of Massachusetts Lowell and this beautiful university crossing. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to look out across the river at our north campus, we're so proud of this university and so proud to have you here. And I see so many of our students, alumni, and faculty in the audience, and I, I want you to know how much I appreciate your participation in this great evening. At UMass Lowell, you know that we take very seriously our commitment to the Commonwealth and the needs of the Commonwealth in our community. Everyone here, I think, can take great pride in this university, UMass Lowell, and what we're doing here to prepare the next generation, the next generation for the workforce, the members of our community, and also take great pride in the cutting edge research that we're doing across this great university. You know, when I first heard about the Commonwealth Conversation Tour last year, I was so impressed by the commitment of our state Senate to engage in plans for moving this state forward, and most importantly, engaging you and hearing you and what your ideas are. Congratulations to Senator Roderick for uh, bringing this idea to the forefront. But of course, this work should be no surprise. And I have to say, especially in the past year, this is a time we can all take great pride and comfort 
and being members of this great commonwealth where our senators take the time to go out and listen to you and hear what the challenges are that you face, listen to your hopes, your dreams for the future, and how they can assist in developing policy that will advance those hopes and dreams. We're honored to have a role, a small role, in hosting you tonight and facilitating this discussion. I would personally like to thank <coughs> Senator Donahue for her incredible leadership as a senator and prior to being a senator, her incredible commitment to the city of Lowell where she served on the city council with great leadership and was one of the biggest change agents that led this great gateway city to the terrific place that it is, not the place where we are now. <laughs> And I know when she joined the Senate, she looked forward to working with her colleagues, those represented here, to take the lessons that we learned about strong partnerships in Lowell to the Commonwealth. And we look at this tour as, I think, a similar effort. She has been tremendous. And of course, I would also like to thank the Senate President, Stan Rosenberg, who has similarly been a great champion, not just for the university system, which of course he has been a fantastic champion for all of UMass, but his leadership in the Senate has led to so many uh, positive changes for the Commonwealth, so many great initiatives that so many of us in this room have benefited from. Thank you, Senator Rosenberg, for your great leadership. <laughs> and thank you to all of the members of the State Senate we really appreciate your leadership. You are doing God's work in serving us, and we want you to know that we know the challenges you face as leaders, and thank you for taking the time to come and meet with this group. But before my final word, little secret. Okay, so Senator Donahue and Senator Rosenberg are both graduates of UMass Amherst. Now, we're not competitive at <laughs> UMass Lowell. And we know that they really care about the whole UMass system and they treat us all equally and as which, with as much love as possible that they spread across all the system. But if you want to be in on a secret, who won Hockey East Championship <laughs> this past weekend? And I do think our Riverhawks are their favorite hockey team. Absolutely. And the truth is, we wouldn't be where we are without those two as lucky charms at our games throughout the season. So a special <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Honestly, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for being at the university, and good luck with this discussion. Thank you, Chancellor Maloney. Let's hear for cha uh, outstanding chancellor for the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. Uh, next, we'll hear from our Senate president, Senate President Stan Rosenberg. Well, good evening, and thank you very much for uh, hosting us here this evening, Senator Donahue, and thank you, Chancellor, for the generous words uh, that you've uh, given tonight to uh, Senator Donahue, well-deserved, and uh, also uh, for all of the work that the Senate is trying to do uh, through our shared leadership model. And uh, there's an innovation happening tonight, and, and I may not have been paying attention, and maybe Senator Donahue has already said it, but this will be the first Commonwealth conversation that's ever been broadcast live on radio. So thank you, WCAP, for broadcasting this. And uh, that's another wonderful innovation, and that was uh, locally generated, and so thank you. That's really terrific. Uh, my role right now is to I explained to you very briefly uh, how uh, w what the meaning of this is because um, you know sometimes uh, uh, political people go out and they do listening tours and uh, people wonder well what are they really doing and what are they really going to do with the information and so uh, what I'd like to do is to tell you uh, that you are part of the process that the Senate uses to establish its priorities and set its agenda. And so the ideas and the issues and the concerns and the thoughts that you will present to us this evening will be used along with what we're hearing in eight other full days of touring the Commonwealth. 
and we will go back to the State House with all of that information and we will meet internally to then decide what our priorities are going to be. And uh, as a way of demonstrating how this actually works, I invite you uh, when you get home tonight or sometime uh, not so long from now to go to the legislative website, navigate to the Senate page and then to the Commonwealth Conversations page. And there you will find the report that was produced at the end of the Commonwealth Conversations tour two years ago. And then you'll also find a report that was written and posted at the end of the two-year term. So you see what we heard from the public, and then you'll see what we actually did, and what got into law, and what got to the House. And not everything, of course, made it all the way to the governor's desk, but there's always uh, this term, and we will take your ideas and your thoughts, and we'll blend it with uh, a lot of other information that we gather, and we will use it to try to advance a, an agenda that will meet the needs of the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I also want to say that Senator Donahue is going to be playing a new role in the Senate, and it's a special role, because there's a committee called Steering and Policy, which historically has had a wonderful job description that was unimplemented. It was great on paper, but it never actually happened in the Senate. So uh, Senator Donahue has been appointed the chair of the Committee on Steering and Policy, and the job of the Committee on Steering and Policy is to identify legislation as it comes out of various committees that fit within the priorities and the agenda that was established as a result of the Commonwealth Conversations, and steer those into the Policy Council, which she will also chair, which is a group of seven senators who then uh, work in the Democratic Caucus to advance to the Democratic Caucus the issues that we will be undertaking. But we are also a bipartisan group because although a small band they, though they are, the Republicans are a very uh, mighty force in the Senate and their opinions and their ideas are also integrated uh, as a result of their participation in the Commonwealth Conversations. So um, Senator Donahue will be playing a very, very special role in this newly empowered committee, which uh, Senator Dan Wolf chaired last term and established the uh, foundation for this expanded role for the uh, Steering and Policy Committee. And I want to thank Senator Donahue for being willing to take on that huge responsibility. And she's your senator, so I think you should give her a round of applause for that <laughs> job that she's about to do. And hopefully from that, she will take encouragement from uh, the uh, support that she has back home as she works with her colleagues. And finally, I want to say um, that you will see that a number of us have tablets in front of us and, uh, and iPhones. I know we are not playing words with friends or doing our emails. Many of us are using these to take our notes, uh, which we'll be using as we go through uh, the Commonwealth Conversations. So um, as, as we go through the rest of the evening, you will see you have a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter of the State Senate sitting in front of you to hear your thoughts. And uh, as you will see, we will only be listening. We will not be talking, uh, we will not be asking questions, and we won't be engaging in debate with each other or with you. We're here to listen. Thank you. And next, we will hear from the leader of that very strong but small band, the minority leader, Senator Bruce Tarr. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator, and uh, I, I want to begin with a series of thank yous. The first is uh, to say thank you to Senator Donahue for reminding us just how important uh, this university is and for arranging for us to be here tonight to open the doors, to turn on the microphones, and engage in one of the truest forms of democracy. So, Senator, thank you for that, and thank you to the Chancellor and everyone at UMass Lowell for allowing us to be here in this place together tonight. I also want to say thanks to our legislative delegation in this region, uh, which includes uh, Senator Donahue, also includes uh, Senator O'Connor Ives, uh, because we have spent uh, the day 
actually touring this part of the state, which is a part of the Commonwealth conversations uh, that we need to highlight. So we started this morning in Newburyport. We then went to Ipswich. We then went to Lawrence General Hospital. And now we've come here because part of Commonwealth conversations is allowing us as senators to go and see some of the highlights, some of the important things that are happening in every part of the state. And our legislative delegation from this part of the state, uh, I think, did a great job. And I want to say thanks to them uh, for helping us put this together so we could see all of those other places before we got to you here tonight. While I'm saying thank you, I also want to say thank you to Senator Rodericks because it was his idea at the beginning of the last legislative session for us to go out and to do this. And I am honored to be uh, co-chairing the Commonwealth Conversations with Senator Rodericks, with the Senate President, which brings me to my next point. One of the reasons that it is important for us to come out and do this and share this time with you is to show you the model by which the Massachusetts State Senate operates. It is one which is respectful, is bipartisan, engages in healthy, informed debate, and makes progress on the issues that come before it. And we want to come out and demonstrate that to everyone, not only to show you the people that we represent, but also hopefully to share an example with others that we hope will follow from that model. In addition to that, the most important reason that we come to you tonight is to be able to hear from you and to be able to be guided by what your thoughts are for priorities and issues of particular interest that we should be considering as we move forward in this legislative session. And I will tell you that for all of these that we've had so far, we have had vigorous turnouts, we have had robust participation, and it validates the fact that when we came out and said, will people participate, they would, and once again tonight, you have. Now along the way, we know that many of you will come up to this microphone and talk about issues that are very concerning to you. We know that for some of you, they may even be hard to talk about. You may share with us a personal experience that's difficult to reiterate and share in public. For all of that, we are deeply appreciative. We know it's not easy all the time to speak in public. We know sometimes it's not easy to share those things with us, but it is critically important to all of us that you do that and we are deeply, deeply appreciative that you've chosen to come and do it with us tonight. Now, as the Senate President mentioned, and I want to reinforce, you will see something tonight that is among the most rarest of things in the political spectrum. You will see approximately 30% of the state Senate, and I'm not that good at percentages, but a very significant percentage of state senators sit in front of you and say absolutely nothing. And that is because, <laughs> The influence or the importance of this process and the focus of it is not on us. We wind up in the media a lot for the things we say, but equally as important to speaking and saying something is listening. And that is the point of tonight. It could not happen without everyone that's made to work to make it possible. And we are all delighted to be here to spend this time with you. Thank you so much for coming out to participate. And next, I am going to turn the microphone over to the senator, as I mentioned earlier, whose idea it was to do this exercise, to go across the Commonwealth with Commonwealth conversation. So without further ado, Senator Michael Rodericks. Thank you, Senator. Good, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, we began the day very early. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not from these pots. Uh, I'm from southeastern Massachusetts. Um, I'm a, an alum of UMass Dartmouth, so we have Lowell, Amherst, and Dartmouth alums. All, we all share the passion uh, for the University of Massachusetts. Um, just to lay down some instructions in the ground rules, where everyone's going to have uh, two minutes uh, to speak, to, to tell us whatever is on your mind, whatever is important to you, we are here to listen. DJ's going to have the timer, so you'll hear the tone go off, and we'd ask you uh, to respect that. Um, and to conclude your remar remarks um, when the tone um, goes off. Uh, we'd also ask you to uh, tweet any of your thoughts. Our uh, hashtag is NEConvos or MAConvos. Um, so please uh, tweet your thoughts and your comments. And I was informed today, although I'm not 
that technologically uh, adept, but that um, uh, NE con the hashtag NE convos was trending today. So I think that's a good thing, right, Kelsey? Very good. Uh, also, as the Senate President stated, uh, the website is malegislature.gov slash cc. It, there is an online survey going on um, before the conclusion of tonight's uh, forum. We're going to give you the results uh, to date, uh, to, to that time, uh, of the issues that uh, you are all voting on online of the most important issues uh, before us. So uh, we're going to begin. And as uh, was stated by both the Senate President and the Minority Leader, um, even though there are a number of microphones uh, in front of us, the only one using going to use it, Senator Donahue, is she introduce our uh, speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roderick. So uh, what I will do, we have people who have signed up. If someone wants to speak and just hasn't signed up to speak yet, you can do so outside. Um, we just want to make sure we hear from everybody here tonight who would like to be heard. So what we will do, we have a, a microphone and a seat set up. I will announce two people at once. The first one who's coming up and then the next who is going to be on deck so that we can keep things moving. So first up we have Carl Nellis. And the next person, uh, as Carl's making his way, is Patrick Cook. Uh, so just just so you know, welcome. Uh, first, I'd just like to say thank you, senators, for uh, for coming out and listening. Um, I am from Gloucester, so. Uh, I came to have a nice, uh, quiet, personal chat with, uh, with you, Senator Tarr. Um, I'm a member of a small group uh, called Essex County Number 6 Indivisible. We've just started meeting in the past few months and talking about um, the, the legislative priorities that, that we have that we would like to share with the Senate. Um, and one of the things that's really inspired us in the past few months is um, the ACLU's Freedom Agenda. Are you familiar with the, with the Freedom Agenda? You're, you're nodding yes. Um, so there are a few uh, bills that have been proposed that have really excited us that we can get behind. Uh, the Fundamental Freedoms Act, which is uh, sponsored by Senator Chandler. The Safe Communities Act, uh, which Senator Eldridge sponsored. Um, the, electronic, the Electronic Privacy Act, which Senator Spilka sponsored. And the Mandatory Minimums Repeal, um, which Senator Cream sponsored. Um, so there are a number of us from Gloucester so your constituents, um, people who, I live on Beacon Street, uh, people who walk down Main Street, I do my laundry on Chestnut Street at the Homestyle Laundry, um, and I know that a number of my neighbors are afraid. They're very scared. Um, whether it's about our personal privacy uh, with our electronic communications, whether it's about um, whether we will be uh, caught up in uh, deportation raids, whether it is that we um, we'll have our rights to free speech curtailed. Um, and so we are excited about this legislation that is putting those issues front and center and that wants uh, strong protections for, um, for us, for our neighbors, for our rights, um, written into Massachusetts state law. And so we urge you as your constituent, Senator Tarr, to co-sponsor these bills. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Cook? I don't see Patrick. Uh, Lynn Sousa. Is Lynn here? Okay. Lauren Corcoran. Lauren Corcoran. Sorry, this is Lynn. Oh, Lynn. Oh. Sorry. Hi. Welcome. Um, I'm here just to um, um, bring some attention on the foreclosure crisis still in Massachusetts. Um, I just joined an organization called um, MAPL, and I have been fighting my mortgage company for five years. Um, and it's basically taken everything out of me. But um, at one point, I did function at a high level. And then um, there was a lot of sickness in my family which led to hardship and the mortgage company offered me a modification, but they play their games and I submit my documents and they try to foreclose. So um, 
in, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research and looked at the number of um, families that have been foreclosed in the state, and it's like astronomical. Um, so we could really help, use some help there. I mean, I'm like petrified. I don't know, you know, if I lose, do lose my home, where I'm gonna end up going. Um, and it shouldn't be that way, because I worked hard for my house, and I had a great career. But um, the stress that they put on you and the games that they play with the sole intention of just taking your house in the, in the end anyway, um, it's just horrible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lauren Corcoran. Good evening, Senators and Mr. President. Thank you so much for coming to Lowell. Um, I live in the Paducahville res um, area of Lowell. I'm also Director of Government Relations for Mass Senior Care. Um, we represent most of the nursing facilities around the state. There are about 400. Um, we have a lot of concerns. A lot, of course, are based on some anxieties related to repeal and replace ACA. Um, that will actually take place about the same time in 2020 as the bubble hits for baby boomers. Um, but we have other fiscal pressures like many healthcare organizations, um, including issues with our user fee, and now some new slight regulatory threats that could disrupt our sector to the point of very quick closures to a number of nursing homes, almost a nursing home in every single one of your senator dis senatorial districts, about 134. These homes are uh, five-star quality homes often. Um, so we will be meeting with you at the State House. Since you came to my house, I'm going to come to 24 Beacon <laughs> to your house, um, and we'll visit and talk more about that. But we do have some real concerns around the ACA repeal and replace happening at about the same time that we're looking at having an influx of seniors, whether they need short-term or long-term care. And the fact that we haven't had a base year update that's significant since 2007. Many nursing homes, most, um, Half of our providers are, are operating in the red. Some only have four days cash on hand. If you have a business background, that's terrifying. Um, so we see some real trouble ahead, and we'll be meeting with you um, individually about that. But I thank you for your time, and thank you for coming to Lowell. And I'll see you at the State House. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, next, Mike Sullivan. And let me ask, I don't know if there's a panel that wants to speak together. There if you want to come up together for uh, Mass Realtors, that's great. And it just identify your yourself by name. And if you want to stand and hold the microphone, whatever is more comfortable. Stand behind. Stand behind. Okay. Just just so we know who who's who. Do you mind? Will sure. Molina, Mike Sullivan, Kim Weeks. Kim Weeks. Kim Weeks. Great. And Paul York. And Paul York. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the Senate. I'm Mike Sullivan. I'm a co-owner of a real estate agency. We're located in Methuen, Lawrence, and North Reading. Um, I'm here as, as part of a, a board of directors for the Northeast Association of Realtors. That's all, always also part of the Mass Association of Realtors, consisting of approximately 24,000 realtors throughout the state of Massachusetts. And our message is, um, to help with the affordability of housing. As we all know, there's a shortage of housing, and the housing market just seems to be um, tough for just about everybody to afford. And there's some, um, a great bill that was sponsored, that was filed by Senator Sear, that we're excited about. Uh, it's called the First Time Home Buyer Savings Account Program. And, um, Due to the rising cost of housing and crippling student loan debt, it's impacting uh, younger generations um, for, to try to buy houses. Um, saving for a down payment and closing costs is extremely challenging in today's economy. And programs like the Home Buyer Savings Account uses a small state tax incentive to encourage future home buyers to save for the purchase of their home. And we feel the benefits of home ownership to individuals and communities are well documented. This program would allow future home buyers to deposit up to $5,000 per year into a first time home buyer savings account and then claim that contribution as a deduction on their income tax. 
Aside from the great pride that home ownership can take, as you all know, when achieving the American dream, there's a tremendous amount of economic activity that follows from the purchase. According to research from the National Association of Realtors, when a home is bought, consumers spend an average of $4,572 on items such as furniture, appliances, and remodeling. And in addition to this to, uh, economic multiplier, uh, in Massachusetts, the effect uh, estimates about $17,000 uh, into the economy with restaurants, uh, sports, and charity events. And um, we uh, highly endorse this, and you're gonna hear from a couple of other uh, speakers behind me talking about housing affor affordability, and thank you for your time. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity, and again, thank you, Senators, for setting this forum. Um, my name is Will Molina, and I'm a realtor uh, at the office of Cogarley and Associates in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and we have uh, several offices in the Merrimack Valley, so Merrimack Valley is my home. And I'd like to talk uh, or voice my concern uh, with regards to a bill that would allow current homeowners to complete any necessary loan modifications, short sales, and foreclosures, and remain exempt from paying taxes on the said forgiven uh, debt. Um, the Massachusetts Association of Realtors supports uh, S1568, an act relative to discharge of indebtedness of principal residents from gross income. This bill was filed by Senator Mark Magani. This bill would mirror the federal law, the Mortgage Debt Relief Act of 2007. It would allow homeowners who complete loan modifications, short sales, and foreclosures to be held harmless from tax liability on the, foreign, on the forgiven debt. We call this phantom income. Under current state law, the amount forgiven is treated as a taxable event. Let me give you an example. Assume a family purchased their home for 300,000 with a mortgage of 275,000. Later, they need to sell this home, but the home value in their area have declined and they can only sell for 225,000. At the time of the sale, the outstanding balance on their mortgage is 250, not leaving enough cash at settlement to repay the lender for the full balance. If the lender forgives the entire difference between the amount owed and the sales price, the debt forgiven will be 25,000. Under current Massachusetts law, the amount of forgiven mortgage debt is treated as income and taxed as ordinary income rates. Thus, the seller who experienced a true economic loss is required to pay tax on this phantom income. Even though no cash has been changed hands and even though their experience is a loss, under this proposal, the forgiven amount is not subject to income tax Sorry. If this amendment is not enacted, homeowners will continue to pay income tax on phantom income on their state tax returns. Homeowners should not be forced to pay taxes on money, on money they have already lost with cash they never received and will never receive. A personal experience. Um, I'm sorry, but the, the bell went off. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. It's, Hopefully you'll support it. We, thank you very much. Just um, when, when you hear that bell, that just is your time is I up. I thought it was someone's phone going off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Kim Weeks, and I'm a, a realtor in Newburyport, Massachusetts. I'm also president of our Newburyport board, and I'm here to speak on the home bill. And um, I guess I would like to voice the same concern as a realtor regarding the affordability of housing in Massachusetts and just provide a few ways that we can begin to address this problem. The first is by supporting an act improving housing opportunities in the Massachusetts economy. So due to the short supply of housing in Massachusetts, the potential homeowners, they continue to face increasing housing costs. And one of the many issues driving the reduced housing stock is the presence of barriers of production, many of which are found in the current zoning laws. So the Massachusetts Association of Realtors, in conjunction with the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, do support S-94, filed by Senator Rodericks, which addresses some of the barriers. Some of the provisions include the allowing of multifamily housing construction by right, 
allowing accessory dwelling units by right, easing the production of cluster development housing, simplifying the variance burdens, and approving special permits by a majority vote. Zoning is too often, it's used to prevent the production of new housing in Massachusetts. So this bill requires that each community share in the work required to begin addressing the problem of affordable housing in our Commonwealth. I thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Next. Good evening. My name is Paul Yorkis. I am the president of the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. And I would like to thank you collectively as a group, but also each one of you individually for being here and for um, listening to not just us, but all of the other folks who will be speaking with you tonight. I am asking you not to pass legislation to necessarily, but to use your influence this evening when you get back to the State House to try and change some regulations that would allow all of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to have the opportunity to have high speed internet. This portion of the Commonwealth is fine. Western Mass and North Central Mass is not. Um, Yesterday I had the opportunity, along with another realtor from Alford, Massachusetts, yes, there is a community named Alford, um, fellow by the name of Tom Doyle, and we met with Deborah Anderson and Donald W. Boke, both of whom are assistant attorney generals who deal with contracts. And there are municipal light power companies that want to implement high-speed internet services. And the um, Massachusetts Broadband Institute has been changing their policies quickly recently. But money is what is needed to be freed up so this can happen quickly because the economic impact of a lack of broadband service in western and north central Massachusetts is having an incredibly negative impact on housing, on education, and on small businesses. And we believe that you are in a position to talk with members of the administration about making every, having as many rules and regulations streamlined as possible so the money be, can become available, and in addition, Last comment is to please consider uh, changing the Mass Works grant program to include high speed internet as an eligible project. And again, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, also listed Saloy La Lafferty, or Laff, no? Okay, next, D. Halsnick. And I wanna make sure. How's it? Oh, I just wanted to make sure I was pronouncing your name correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Senators, for coming to listen to us. I'm here to speak in support of the Safe Communities Act. Um, food is a basic need of all of us, and from markets to restaurants to um, Farming operations in the state, food, um, our food supply is very dependent on the participation of immigrants, some of whom are, yes, undocumented, and going after them would affect the state. Um, the state has a lot of other needs um, that are more important than enforcing federal immigration law. I would rather see our state resources spent dealing with the opioid crisis and not going after undocumented immigrants. Um, you can't tell who's undocumented by looking at somebody, which means, and has already caused people who have legitimate documentation for being in the US to be harassed. And I would not want to see our state continue to support that kind of operation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Richard Howe.
Good evening. Um, particularly Senator Donahue must be looking and saying, that's not Richard well, there's Howe. A, there's two. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not related to the more famous the Lowell Howes, um, <laughs> but I'm from Andover and Senator Latai. Well, welcome. District. We're happy to see Thank you. Thank you. I think, in fact, my namesake may be here tonight. He and, was. He was here a minute and ago. And I hope I, I don't him. embarrass him. <laughs> Um, I uh, am recently retired. Uh, I live in Andover, um, and uh, and just after the election this fall, uh, I went to a meeting, as many of us did, that was called by uh, Congressman Seth Moulton uh, down in Peabody, and about five or six hundred of us there divided up into groups on various issues. Um, the one that I chose that I feel very strongly about is income inequality, uh, and attended a, a group meeting there. Uh, and we've met since then. Um, Massachusetts is one of the worst states in the country in terms of the inequality between our highest earners and our lowest earners. And, uh, and that's been the trend in all states since the 1970s. So as we met, um, we, dis we wanted what we could do to think globally but act locally. And we decided that uh, we would link up with an organization called Raise Up Massachusetts that you may all have heard of. Um, <clears throat> because the three priorities of Raise Up Massachusetts uh, all affect income in inequality and uh, provide some very specific steps that could be taken to uh, improve the situation here in Massachusetts so that we can continue to be a leading state in the country in many ways, as, as uh, you all know. Um, so the three priorities for this year are uh, paid family and medical leave, um, a, a bill that is uh, was uh, filed by um, <clears throat> by uh, Senator Karen Spoka, um, Senate 1048, and is co-sponsored, I think, by many of the other senators, including a number of you here. Um, secondly, a bill to raise the minimum wage uh, to $15, uh, Senate 1004, sponsored by Senator Ken Donnelly. And the third is the fair share amendment to the Constitution, which would allow a um, tax, an additional surtax of 4% on incomes uh, over $1 million. Um, as you can understand, these three directly address the issue of income inequality, and I hope that the Senate will continue to support them and will uh, support the constitutional amendment when it comes up again this, in the spring. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Danny Keating. Danny Keating. And next up is Sam Poulton. Maybe, maybe we'll take Mr. Poulton while we wait for Danny. There you go. Good evening, and thank you very much. And uh, thank you, President Rosenberg, for the shout out to WCAP. Uh, I'm not here uh, as a member of uh, WCAP at the microphone, but rather as a school committee man from Neshoba, <clears throat> Neshoba Valley Technical High School. We're proud to be part of the excellent education community we all enjoy in the Merrimack Valley. In times of budget constraints, please remember our regional vocational high schools because they're valuable, cost-effective, and successful partners in the education of the Commonwealth students. In fact, I'm especially proud to be here at UMass Lowell because this is part of a seamless path to jobs, research, and lifelong learning that our students enjoy by simultaneously taking classes at Neshoba Tech and Middlesex Community College to eventually come to UMass Lowell. Not only does this benefit our students, it benefits us because they stay here. We are a regional school, and as such, we bring all of our students to us on buses. And when regional schools were formed, a promise was made that that cost would be offset by the Commonwealth because of the savings of having, in our case, the towns of, I don't want to forget anybody, uh, the towns of uh, Chelmsford, Ayer, Littleton, Pepperell, Shirley, Townsend, and Westford brought to a central location. Yet every year, not only don't we get reimbursed 
that reimbursement seems to always be cut. So I'm asking for you to consider our value when that is done. And one other thing, we at Neshova are part of seven school districts. Please don't make us compete for funds. Work out a way for regional vocational schools to be funded not to the detriment of the sending communities. Thank you. Thank you. Danny Keating. Did, did someone find Danny Keating yet? No? Okay, well, we'll move on. Um, Robert LeBlanc. So I guess we'll do one. Pass, Robert LeBlanc, pass. Pass, okay. Keith Jones. Keith Jones here. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, climate change uh, and global warming. Uh, I think Massachusetts is an extremely progressive state. We've led on the uh, health care bill with uh, um, Romney Care. We've led on gay marriage, and I think we should uh, start leading on uh, climate change. There's a, there's a bill that was proposed, S1849. Uh, it's an act to transition Massachusetts to 100% renewable energy by 2035 for electricity. And uh, 2050, uh, transportation and uh, heating. Uh, I think it's extremely important for us to uh, think of my generation and my son's generation and uh, transition and lead the country. Uh, I'd also like to beat California to 100% in <laughs> renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you. Tress Ricker. Tress Ricker. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. And the next will be Mark Dion, if, if Mark's here. Hello, Senators. Thank you for coming uh, to listen to us. My name is Tress Ricker, and I'm the Central Regional Manager for the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on behalf of the citizens in this area of the state who have sustained brain injury. Individuals with brain injury are everyday people like you and me. A brain injury changes the way you think, act, move, and the way you feel. Individuals with brain injury have trouble with short-term memory, concentration, judgment, and organization. People with serious brain injuries may need constant supervision and help in managing money, doing household chores, bathing, and dressing. Because the injuries are not always visible, people with brain injuries may have trouble qualifying for federal and state programs. Families provide the majority of care, and the balance is left to the community to pick up the pieces. Many exhaust their family resources or have to give up jobs to care for a family member full time and are at risk of losing their homes. The psychological and financial stress is overwhelming as families struggle to provide care with little or no help from existing state service systems. A brain injury can happen to anyone, anytime. In an instant, life as you know it can be taken away. Most people don't really understand brain injury or its prevalence. There are more than 67,000 Massachusetts residents that sustain a traumatic brain injury each year. The Brain Injury Association advocates for the brain injury and statewide specialized community services program, commonly referred to as SHIP, for state services for brain injured survivors. This is an agency under the Mass Rehab Commission. SHIP has gained a national reputation as the program is considered a national model. Uh, I would ask that you consider brain injury uh, when you're making decisions of your priorities this year, it's a very underprivileged population. And I have some packets for you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, oh, Mark Dion. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming, I guess. Uh, what I'd like to say is this, and it's probably not going to make me the most popular man in the room, but I would sincerely hope that as senators, you do not push through any legislation that protects criminal aliens, illegal immigrants. 
okay? I heard one of a gentleman here speaking about being afraid. Well, we're afraid. We're afraid of, of this state becoming like California. We're afraid of illegals, this SAFE Act, so that illegals are protected and they're not, they're not the police won't help the, the government deport people that are here illegally. And they are criminals. We're afraid of that. We're afraid of politicians that give themselves enormous raises while towns are struggling and other social, social people and social things are, are losing money and don't have money to fund them. That's what we're afraid of. Sorry if I sound so angry, but you know what? There's a lot of people out here and we've had it up to here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Ann Furtado. Ann Furtado. Hi, thank you. Um, I represent a group called Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. And I'm a reluctant political person because I got involved in this group after Sandy Hook. It's not my issue. I never had anybody personally die. It's a very extremely personal issue, though, to me. It's not the only issue that's important to me, responding to the person that just went before me. I'm afraid of that, of being murdered here by people that have guns that shouldn't have them. I'm not afraid of immigrants. I'm not afraid of Muslims. I'm afraid of losing my Bill of Rights. I became involved politically from going to experience what we had in a, what we saw going on in Sandy Hook moved me to conviction. And I've gone from conviction to action. I've been several indivisible groups. And this is one of the things that I can do to try to ask you to also look at that. So when the changes come and we're, go we're going to get concealed carry everywhere, what can Massachusetts do? We have a great attorney general who has done marvelous things, has stuck her neck out on the line because she's actually trying to enforce the assault weapons ban that has, that the other thing that happens here is we make laws but we don't enforce them. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, thank you. Paul Dion, Paul Dion. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you people for coming out here. Um, my name is Paul Dion. I am here tonight to ask you to support Senator Pacheco and Representative Michelle Dubois with docket number HD3334. The docket would reinstate the Taxpayers Protection Act, um, and the Taxpayer Protection Act would help the MBT, MBTA save money and stop privatization. As we all know, privatization is not the answer. We can see that it has failed with the main military authority, asking the MBTA for two, $2 million more in the state of Maine for $7 million because they underbid the job. And also with Keolis asking for more money to run a service, they said that would save money. These companies are making a profit off the taxpayers of Massachusetts, and uh, the Taxpayer Protection Act would make bidders show proof of a savings and not just be the lowest bidder. I truly believe that the MBTA has the best trained machinist mechanics, whatever the, you want to call us, for the job. For a company to come in and pay the help less money, you're going to get less qualified service, and that would definitely lead to a safety issue um, for the public using the MBTA. So I'm asking you to please think about what I have said here tonight and support docket HD3334. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jackson Brown. Well, first, thank you very much for um, setting this all up. It's wonderful to um, get some face time with a lot of you. Um, this is actually directed at Senator Bruce Tarr. As you know, 
Massachusetts has become the state with the lowest gun violence rate in this country. This is according to the most recent CDC report. The evidence in this report shows that year after year, that states with common sense gun laws have lower gun violence rates compared to those that don't. I can't presume to know where you stand on all gun laws, but I am concerned about your most recent actions. You have tried not only to oppose more Healy's gun violence initiative, but you have also actively tried to strip away her authority as Attorney General in this regard. You have introduced legislation to legalize silencers here in the state of Massachusetts, and you have aligned yourself with the Gun Owners Action League at their events. So my question is, and it's basically a rhetorical one, um, do you care about gun violence prevention? And if so, why do you spend all this time trying to fight it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Gun Gunther Wallenstein. Gunther Wallenstein. Oh, there you are. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for making time for this public forum. And uh, welcome back. Uh, let me... Um, set the stage here for a second. My name is Gunther Wellenstein. I'm the solid waste manager for the city of Lowell. I'm here to ask uh, the, you guys as a group of senators to consider the paint bill when it, uh, the paint care bill when it comes before you. Lowell manages household hazardous waste as do all of the municipalities you, you uh, um, represent. Specifically paint is a tremendous cost to the municipalities. In last year's budget, um, in previous budgets, Lowell allocated $50,000 for two events. That's a lot of money for two events. Unfortunately, those resources aren't available anymore. The current fiscal year, the city allocated $20,000. I can't do these kind of events um, with less money. The paint care bill would create a statewide infrastructure managed by the American Coatings Association to collect, recycle, and dispose of that leftover paint. Consider this for a moment. It's estimated that 10% of retail paint is left over. How many paint cans do you have in your basement, garage, or shed? Ask the real estate agents who represent <coughs> clients. What do we do with that volume? At this time, the city is responsible for the collection and the disposal costs of the unused paint. Latex can be dried out and put in the trash. That goes to our tonnage and our cost. Oil-based, which is a hazardous, is flammable as a hazardous waste, comes to our events, and we pay clean harbors to transport and incinerate it, another municipal cost. Both of these options bypass the possibility of recycling paint. The American um, Coatings Association will process, collect, the, um, collect and process the paint, and even reblend it for resale. Once the infrastructure is in place, residents could visit any paint retailer, big box stores or otherwise, and drop off their paint at no cost. It would not be a um, burden to the municipality. Only Massachusetts and New Hampshire and um, New England are missing the paint care bill. So we uh, appreciate your time and hopefully consider it when it comes before you. Thank you. Thank you, Gunther. <laughs> Meredith Moody. Hello, uh, my name is Meredith Moody, and I belong to a group called the uh, Social Justice Coalition in Andover, and um, we've broken up into affinity groups that are working on, uh, and I'm on the Environment Climate Change Group, and um, Basically, we've uh, taken the tack that uh, stave off disaster at the federal level and make progress at the state level. And um, the most promising thing that we've looked at and that we're working for is the uh, Senate 1821 bill, the carbon fee and rebate um, bill um, that that looks like uh, would be tremendous progress uh, for the state. Um, in British Columbia, they've been doing it for five years, 
and uh, it's really worked. Um, and uh, so the fear about hurting the economy uh, just isn't realistic. Um, so um, I'm asking you all to uh, think seriously about supporting 1821 and uh, thank you for whatever you do towards uh, fighting climate change. So thank you very much. Thank you. Janice Holden. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, humbly also a member of the Social Justice Coalition. Um, and I originally came uh, from Andover. I came tonight to speak um, in favor of making Massachusetts the leader in progressive legislation to stem climate change. Um, I'm in favor of market incentives to reduce burning of carbon fuels, like Senator Barrett's Bill 1821. I also want to advocate um, strongly and deeply for immigrants and refugees in Massachusetts. I encourage you to support <laughs> efforts to continue and broaden our legacy as a welcoming community. I want to share an anecdote from my experience working at the Boys and Girls Club with children from poor families in Lawrence. Two brothers dashed in um, at the end of January, beginning of February, agitated and distraught. They haven't been really able to focus for weeks in uh, fourth grade and sixth grade. They informed me in a panic that they couldn't finish the class because their parents were going to have to leave. They're going to have to go back to the Dominican Republic because they don't have papers. And they've been... Um, pretty much a mess every night um, since then, coming in and um, getting in trouble at school because they're just really worked up. Um, and that is in despite the fact that Lawrence has an, a local ordinance, um, the Lawrence Trust Act, which pr protects law-abiding, unauthorized, working families and um, immigrants that, um, that the ICE um, might persecute um, when they were trying to pursue them, um, whether they uh, hadn't, well, when they hadn't um, performed any kind of cr criminal activity. So these children are afraid and um, distraught, and they're not the only ones, and the, they're the only ones that came forward to me. Um, I also was recently surprised how much other kids are thinking about their immigration status. We made um, a triple green pasta. Yes, I am a licensed nutritionist. Then the kids, I asked them to rename it. And one boy from Cameroon looked up at me and he said, we can call it Liberty Pasta. And I said, why Liberty? And he said, you know, that green lady that's standing, Liberty Pasta. So, <laughs> thank you. We thank need you. to make it a good world for our children. Thank you. Quinn Lawrence. Hi, thank you for uh, coming to meet with us tonight and listen to us. Uh, my name is Quinn Lawrence. I'm on the Lowell Sustainability Council, and um, I've heard a lot of people speak about different things tonight, and I just wanted to echo some of those things. Um, Gunther had mentioned the paint bill, and um, I want to echo support for that. I think it's a common sense uh, market incentive for, uh, for caring for the environment. It's, it's a good bill, uh, the paint stewardship bill. Also, the carbon tax makes great sense. I think Massachusetts should be a leader on that. <clears throat> I'd also like to say um, I want to echo about the uh, doing anything you can do to prevent gun violence. Um, my son was five at the time of Sandy Hook. There's almost nothing I have trouble explaining to my son. I didn't know where to start with Sandy Hook. Um, and um, he's 11 now. And, um, and lastly, um, there's a lot of controversy on the new school site here. Uh, the Article 97 restrictions, they may be exempted. Uh, I would like to see people, uh, our representatives, stick to those, uh, the rules. Um, so if you want to find a new site for the high school, it should be if there's uh, replacement land for it. There's been some talk that generally getting exemptions for 90, Article 97 is really not that hard to do. Um, and I really hope that before you vote in favor of uh, making an exemption and not finding replacement land that you really, uh, you know, think about it and do what's, um, what I think Article 97 was intended to do. Thank you. Thank you. 
Steve uh, Hintner, Hutner, is it Hintner? Yes, Hintner. Hintner, welcome. Thank you. Uh, this is some handouts that you posted. It's ironic that I'm here tonight. Um, in 2009, I was on a task force called the Alimony Reform Task Force. And we had hearings talking from victims of the law that was then. And one of the victims who came to speak was a woman named Estelle Shanley, who was married to John Duff. Does anyone know who John Duff was? He was the first chancellor of the UMass Lowell. Uh, it seems he was uh, dying of Alzheimer's and he couldn't understand why they were taking his house away because he couldn't pay his alimony uh, with the situation that he was in. So we passed a law, unanimous in the House and the Senate, that would uh, allow people to terminate their alimony when they reach retirement age. And if somebody was cohabitating for a three month period, the alimony would end also. Uh, and there were duration limits. So a lot of things were put into this law. The law was passed unanimous in the House and the Senate. Uh, recently, uh, a year ago, the SJC interpreted the law to say that what we wrote, we didn't mean. Uh, a bill has been put in uh, by John Fernandez when he was on the uh, uh, co-chair of the judiciary. He was the chairman of the task force, and he put a bill in to rectify what the, what the SJC misunderstood. Uh, it passed unanimous in the House, but it got hung up in the Senate. Uh, the bill has been put back in again. It's age 740. I'm asking you, pleading with you, for the sake of the, uh, the system, that, uh, that you let it go this time, pass it again, when, when you receive it. I've been meeting with several of you. If you have any questions, my information is on here. Uh, the one question that comes up is that, uh, what happens to people who are expected to have their alimony for the rest of their life? Well, if they signed a, a, a modifiable agreement, than they didn't expect to have for the rest of their life. Number one, number two, we also have deviation factors that we put in when we wrote this new bill that lessen the obligation. So they can, the judge can deviate, so if they really had need, they wouldn't lose it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank your you. Solution. Darlene Wilson. Hi, thank you Hi. for coming here tonight. Um, I actually especially want to thank you, Jamie Eldridge, for uh, proposing the bill for safe communities. Um, you might have noticed some of us are wearing these green mm -hmm. slips. Um, looks a lot like St. Patty's Day, and it might as well be, because really, unless there are uh, any Native Americans in the room, we're all descendants of immigrants. And I think it's important. I think it's important that we make sure that Massachusetts sets the tone for the rest of the country, that we protect our communities of all ages. Um, we need an immigration, um, uh, I'm blanking on the word, but we cannot fault families for uh, a government that it hasn't figured out how to deal with immigration. So that's a two separate things. I think the things that we need to do is make sure that everyone, every resident in this state, however we got here, is protected. And that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, Lisa Lee. Lisa Lee. Hi, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, and again, also thank you, uh, Senator Eldridge, for sponsoring the Safe Communities Act. I also would like <laughs> to ask Senator Donahue to please vote in support of that, as well as all the rest of the senators when it does come for vote. I think it's really important to remain a bastion of support for civil rights and civil liberties in the state of Massachusetts. All of my grandparents are immigrants. Um, I've worked extensively with immigrant communities, uh, undocumented and documented. People come for all kinds of reasons. There are real reasons to leave their home countries um, where there may be violence, any kinds of situations. And you know, it's not our job to assist the federal government in de deporting people or providing more information to ICE, et cetera, or devoting any state resources to a, a Muslim um, database or anything like that. So I just want to really, really encourage everyone to support the Safe Communities Act. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Marina, Marina no Novas. And if I mispronounced your last name, I it's apologize. no vice. No vice. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, hello. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Marina Novice. I'm 20 years old, and I'm a student here at UMass Lowell. I'm studying um, public health with a concentration in community health and health promotion. Um, I wanted to talk about my concern with climate change and the lack of action in the federal government um, for many reasons of which being the injustice that the lower income population carries a disproportionate burden um, caused by uh, carbon, the carbon footprint. Um, the wealthiest Americans contribute the most to carbon pop pollution, but the poor suffer the brunt of the impacts. They're more likely to live in polluted areas, in crowded highways, near dirty power plants. Um, they're the least equipped to deal with loss or any um, structural damage during severe weather, which is all, if not a result of climate change, contributed to by climate change. And it's market distortion. The cost of pollution is not borne entirely by the polluters. Um, so I strongly urge you to pass a carbon pricing policy, um, either H1726 or S1812. Um, I'm optimistic about this climate solution and I hope you will work together. Um, I also wanted to speak up as a member of the campus um, Advocates for Prevention Education here at UMass Lowell. We work to, as a peer educator group to educate each other and spread awareness of sexual violence. I'm very concerned with um, Betsy DeVos's, I'm sorry, um, Betsy DeVos's uh, position as Secretary of Education. She is a woman who has herself donated $25,000 to FIRE. Um, their mission is to empower those who sexually assault rather than those who are sexually assaulted. Um, one in five women on college campuses will be sexually assaulted on our time here um, doing school. And um, she has blatantly expressed her concern or her desire to repeal the Campus Save Act. So I am asking um, as representatives of our state to please keep our st um, the students here in mind. Our safety is important. Um, we shouldn't have to worry about being assaulted on our school campus. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Kim. Sue Kim. Uh, hi, um, I just want to re uh, um, echo what people have said. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm here um, in support of many things, including uh, protecting the environment, uh, gun control. But particularly, um, I'm here to uh, support the Safe Communities Act. Um, I think it's important to understand, uh, A, that a, that people are, you know, being detained and for deportation. People are in the middle of people who have been here for decades, who have built families, who have built jobs, who have been careers, um, who have become stable members of the community. But even more than that, I want to convey to you the sense of terror and anxiety that is being spread in our immigrant communities. People who are, <laughs> it's not just the undocumented who are being sort of affected right now. I can tell you, um, as a teacher, I have students, people who are, you know, either international students or uh, citizens who are afraid. They're afraid because they're Muslim. They're afraid because their parents may be undocumented. They're afraid because their cousin or their brother or their, you know, grandmother might be undocumented or have some kind of, you know, a status, uncertain status. And this is, this is causing havoc in our communities. And you have to understand that even if there isn't a, you know, documented event or where an ice raid is happening, that this sense of Fear and anxiety and terror is it's ubiquitous in these communities. And uh, it's incumbent upon all of you to represent all of, our, um, all of our communities. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mark Grant. Mark Grant. Good, Good evening, evening, Senators. Um, thanks for coming out and listening to us tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm 
a resident of Chelmsford and a member of 350 Mass and Citizens Climate Lobby. If you know those groups, you know that I'm going to advocate for a bunch of measures uh, fighting climate change. Um, I'd like to mention those. Some have already been mentioned. So I have some others. Um, but I'd, then I'd like to tell you briefly why it's so important that we, we make this fight. Um, first, several have mentioned uh, putting a price on carbon. I do support Senator Barrett's uh, bill to do that, 1821. Um, there's also a measure to increase the renewable portfolio standard. I think that's very important that Senator Pacheco has advanced. Um, there's uh, several measures that Senator Eldridge has put forth that I think um, are very important. One is to stop the pipeline tax, uh, to codify the rejection of ratepayer finance for new fossil fuel infrastructure that the SJC uh, decided on last year. Um, there's also a measure to increase the, uh, the incentives for low-income solar to make uh, solar uh, available to, to folks that don't have roofs that are good for it or to renters. And there's also uh, a measure to protect folks from gas leaks. We have over 200 leaks in the city of Lowell that haven't been addressed for decades um, that need to be addressed quickly. They're contributing not only to climate change but also to ground level ozone that's affecting people with respiratory illness and asthma. Very briefly, um, can Massachusetts stop climate change? Not by ourselves. Can we lead on climate change the way we've led on things like health care and marriage equality? Yes, we definitely can. And now is particularly a good time to do that because the federal government is stepping back. So we need to step forward. We need to be the laboratory that shows the nation how it's done over the next four years. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Gina Grandberry. Gina Grandberry. And Grace Ross. <laughs> Um, good evening. Again, my name is Gina Granberry from Lynn, Mass. I'm actually, from, we are Massachusetts, from Lynn. And I'm actually um, calling, I'm here to speak on behalf of the foreclosure issues that still exist in Massachusetts, uh, whether they're most of them are wrongly foreclosed or predatory lending, which happened to be what happened to me back in 2011. Um, it's been six years, and I finally got some resolution. Um, during those six years, it's been like a struggle mentally, but grounded in my faith. That has, to, that has sustained me mentally. I was lucky enough to hear about some um, affidavit or a document need to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds in February to preserve my rights to fight for my home. And it appears the court, even though I haven't, I haven't received in any notice, ruled that I um, get to stay in my home. So once again, I'm just asking you to address the concerns and needs of Massachusetts, especially Lynn, where I live, and of course, all the surrounding areas. Thank you. Thank you. Grace Ross. Um, I just wanted to give a little context to what I knew Gina was going to talk about. Um, you will remember that at the end of 2015, a bill that we suspected would be phenomenally destructive of people's attempts to fight for their homes was passed, um, and a version was signed uh, by the governor, now known as Chapter uh, 141 of the Acts of 2015. Um, this law was put in place, I think, largely on the argument that people weren't fighting for their homes, and therefore um, it was okay to okay the foreclosures that had happened, even though they are f fraught with illegalities. Um, I wanted to put this as a context for Gina's remarks because many of you I know fought, regardless of which side of you were on the fight about that bill, for notification to people that they would know that they needed to put something in the Registry of Deeds to preserve their 20 years to reverse an illegal foreclosure. Gina is now among well over 100 folks that we have spoken with and who we've worked with as the Mass Alliance Against Predatory Lending. Not one of them found out that they had the need to record something at the Registry of Deeds to protect themselves because of the Attorney General. So your attempt to make sure that notification was part of that bill has fallen completely flat. Um, and she got her home back. I don't know if you caught that in her story. She just got the order, apparently came down on March 3rd. But she recorded something at the registry, which if she had not recorded, she could not have gotten that order, even though she's been in court for six years fighting for her home. So this law is not only unfair, but it's not being carried out in a way that anybody knows that they have to preserve their rights, and there are plenty of folks like Gina out there who are fighting, who will have lost their homes because they didn't know and they were not informed. She's 
done an awesome job pro se winning her home back but she wouldn't have been able to do it if people on the ground weren't telling other people because there's been no notification to anybody thank you thank you Patrick O'Mara Patrick how you doing um, Hi. I'm a resident of Lowell um, and thank you all for, for coming out and listening to us and thank everyone else for coming out and talking about so many great issues um, it's great to hear people concerned about so many different things um, I'm here in particular about the Safe Communities Act. I think it's an important piece of legislation that should be pushed up on the agenda. And um, it's great to see people wearing these green armbands. Um, so I think it's pretty clear that a lot of people support this and want to live in communities with immigrants where people feel safe, with uh, productive members of either produ productive members of society. Um, so yeah, I really don't have much to add that Lisa and Sue Kim and other people haven't already said. I just um, want to, you know, encourage you to move it up on the agenda and make it a priority because it seems like a lot of people support it. Um, and thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Maley. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Mike Maley. I'm a resident of Drakeit. I'm in here for asking you for your support of the alimony reform, House Bill 740. Um, I'm going to give you a little brief history of myself. I'm a victim of the alimony law. Um, my wife or ex-wife was an addict. Um, she had 551As filed against her, all supported. DSS came to my home, told me if I didn't file for a divorce that I would lose my kids to um, foster care. Filed for divorce. Since then, it's been a living hell. I was ordered to pay exuberant amount of alimony, no child support. I have sole custody of my kids. Um, I've had them since 2005. This was the only light at the end of the tunnel when alimony reform passed. I was um, fortunate enough to be invited to Governor Patrick's office when it was signed into law. Currently today, uh, the way the rulings have been, they've been all over the place. There's nothing that's justifying that's written what the law was intended to do. Um, I'm still faced with enormous debt. My kids have not been uh, privileged to be brought up like normal kids. Um, this alimony reform is necessary. I beg you to co-support the bill. Um, I know a few of you already have. Um, I'd be more than happy to talk to any one of you privately, um, but please support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Willard. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for actually listening. Uh, I have bad news about the mass budget. It really doesn't stand by itself. I'll give you a couple of examples. The federal government has decided recently to seriously decrease funding in education. And I'd like to ask you people what the state of Massachusetts is going to do to compensate for that. Secondly, the federal government has decided recently to significantly decrease funding for health and human services, particularly for Medicaid, and again, I'd like to know what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is going to do to make up for that loss. Uh, overall, the problem is this. When the federal government spends less on services that the people need, and the state of Massachusetts does nothing to compensate for that, the cities and towns and the people of this Commonwealth will suffer seriously. Help. Thank you. Thank you. Rich. Rich Cowan. Rich Cowan. My name is Rich Cowan, originally from Marshfield and now living in Dracut. I wanted to also thank those of you who helped us in Dracut when we were fighting that big pipeline. I have a first grader 
my town has the third lowest level of per pupil spending in the state. So I wanted to address an issue related to Chapter 70 and requirements for school spending. The issue is this. There are sy systemic disparities within the public school and charter school funding formulas. Now the Senate has already addressed issues of disparity in wealth between towns, which is important, but not my focus this evening. The problem in the formula is that two communities equal in wealth, both spending what they are quote unquote required to spend under the school spending formula, can have vastly different resources to educate a K-12 student. In some districts, the community counts things like retiree insurance, Medicaid reimbursement, school choice revenues as a debit or credit to meeting its obligations to school spending. In other communities, the situation is reversed. This can swing what a district is obligated to spend on its school system by 10% or more. For a district of 3,500 students, that's $4 million a year. Second point, some districts border, uh, border um, other towns with higher levels of school spending where the area charter schools are located. Drake is an example. The result is that our town now pays 30% more on the education of a charter student than what is spent on education of a student in the traditional district or students in the other school choice programs. As a result, the class size for the district schools is 25% higher and language and art classes are available at the charter school but they were cut from the district schools. And now we hear that Donald Trump's budget would cut at least another $75,000 from our special education programs in Drake. Uh, I urge the state Senate to work harder for equity and educational opportunity by standardizing what counts as school spending across towns and to stop over subsidizing charter schools, two practices which are damaging and draining funds from traditional districts. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Pratman. Mark. Thank you, Senators, for coming out here tonight. Uh, I live in the neighboring town of Tewksbury. I'm a uh, town selectman in the town. And what I'm asking is uh, for increased funding for sidewalks along um, uh, uh, Mass DOT roadways, secondary roadways. Um, we have a, the town roadway that goes through our main road is Route 38. Um, it's a shame because we have sidewalks that just end, that go through our town. It's not just Tewksbury, there's a number of towns. Mass DOT at this point has a maintenance contract of, of about $100,000 a year for doing sidewalks improvements for 62 cities and towns. That's not enough to do anything. Um, a couple of years ago they went in and they put handicap accessibility through some of the road on where our sidewalks are, which is great, I love that, but those sidewalks lead to nowhere. And so we have a, num a number of developments that have been going on, uh, specifically on 38. A lot of them are handicapped people that are living there. Each day as I'm driving down the town, I see somebody in a wheelchair getting off the sidewalk, rolling into the middle of the street, and trying to get safely another 100 yards where there is no sidewalks. Um, we need to increase that funding. Um, I would like to see a bill that, say, that would state that any, all secondary state highways must have sidewalks along them. Um, this isn't just for, once again, Tewksbury. There's a number of communities that have secondary roadways and the sidewalks just don't go anywhere. Uh, we, we're growing, we have a number of new developments that are coming in. I see the, the children walking up, the, the up and down the roadway. I mean, they go from, they can't walk from the town center to come to Lowell to go down to the stores without walking in the street. There's no street lighting and neither side of the road has sidewalks. And it's pitch black down there, especially around six o'clock at night, and it's unsafe. Um, and, and it's not just, once again, our community. So if we can increase funding for that, I'd really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bill Schroeder. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bill Schroeder, uh, and I'm here uh, representing the uh, Andover Social Justice Coalition. Uh, you heard earlier tonight from two folks who were members of that. Uh, one of them spoke about uh, climate change, Meredith, uh, and Jan talked about that, and also concerned about immigrants. Um, I won't repeat that because I thought they were eloquent and I couldn't touch that. But what I want to relate to you is that this group got started about a month ago 
when Jan and Meredith put out a call in our church saying that we're concerned about these issues and a bunch of others like them. We're concerned about women's rights. We're concerned about health care. We're concerned about uh, discrimination uh, on the race and, and religion and so forth. And who wants to get involved and take some action? Well, that group has grown from four or five or six to more than 80 in a month. And in our congregation, I'm familiar with how, what it takes to do something like that. That's <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> so what I want to convey, first of all, thank you for coming and listening. And there are a lot of people who are very concerned about these social justice issues and are starting to get involved. And I hope you're hearing it in your telephones. <laughs> And thank you for all you can do to help with this, these issues. We've got a lot on our plate. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Breslow. Hi, thank you for hearing me today. Uh, I'm here to speak also about climate change. I've been working on climate change for the past 17 years. During most of the Patrick administration, I worked on climate change policy at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. I was also director of the Electric Power Division at the Department of Public Utilities. Uh, during that time, I was lead author of the state's Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2020. Um, also, two years ago, when the Department of Energy Resources had a consulting study done on the feasibility and impacts of doing carbon pollution pricing. I was a co-author of that consulting study. So I want to speak to you today on behalf of carbon pollution pricing policy, both the bill in the Senate, Senate 1821, and House Bill, House 1726. Um, as you probably know, the state has legal requirements to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. The first deadline for that is 25 percent by 2020. The last deadline is 80 percent by 2050. Um, as the person who authored the first plan to get us to 2020, I can tell you we may or may not make that. I think we're a little bit short right now. And we have no idea how we're going to get to 2050. Um, we need pollution pricing as one of the principal ways that we can get to those legal requirements. Um, if you do the simple math, we need to be reducing emissions beyond 2020 by close to 20 percent every 10 years. And we do not know how we're going to get there. We need stronger policies. Um, the, number, the exact numbers that we'll need to get there may help be set by uh, Senator Pacheco's bill that would require the state to set um, legal requirements for 2030 and 2040. Um, but we know it, approximately what they need to be. So I urge you to pass carbon pollution pricing as worldwide recognition of a critical policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lucas Brown. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for your time and for the difficult job you undertake trying to understand and amalgamate and listen to all these interests. Uh, I wrote down what I wanted to say to, um, so I came here as a private citizen, sort of on a whim, as a recent college grad, and as a person who is really, really trying to fight off a lot of crippling anxiety about the state of the country and the planet that we are trying to live on. And civic participation has something I think I need to try. Um, I believe really strongly in incentivizing positive changes you want, to you want people to make, and the carbon tax is the most sensible policy and most immediately passable policy solution I can think of to incentivize a change in corporate behavior. And it also creates a federal revenue stream that could potentially be used to continue to fund organizations like the APA that we need now more than ever, and we apparently can't afford anymore. However, none of these actions are really going to be enough by themselves, and that's just really what I wanted to get across, is that we call it climate change to sell it to people who don't want to lose money, but we're talking about averting the end of human society as we know it. 
it's, we, we need to have a lot of policy about immigration and gun control because remaining peaceful and civil in the space we have now is a constant challenge and it's a part of the job you have. So when there are hundreds of, thou hundreds of miles less of land to live on, like when the state of Florida that I was born in is underwater, that's gonna create new challenges that we cannot even imagine without even discussing the resource changes and everything else that comes along with that. It's really important to me to be realistic about this and it's a larger problem than any single election cycle. To me, it's more sensible and effective to levy taxes on industries with a high output of greenhouse gases other than carbon, such as methane, and there's a laundry list of other pressing issues that keep me up and I'd like to talk about, but uh, that's for another time, and for that time to happen, we'll have to have clean water to drink and clean air to breathe to work civilly to solve these problems together. Uh, my generation will really need that, and the next one too. Um, thank you so much for your time, and uh, fight for the EPA, please. Fight for the future of thank the you. next generation. Thank you. <laughs> Nicholas Leroy. Good evening. Good evening. I would like to speak on behalf of myself this evening. Um, I'm a college student, and the big thing I want to say tonight is that if you can make government cool, I mean, I would love to see that. I mean, right now, the federal government is very negative. Like, the whole atmosphere of it is just very negative to me and a lot of other people. A lot of people just don't want to talk about issues just because of all the negativity surrounding everything and the media and ugh. I don't want to get into it. So please, guys, just in your hearts, like, fight for not yourselves, not the guys who are paying you, like the big corporate interests. Please just fight for people like me. I've suffered through autism, like, my whole life. And uh, the state of Massachusetts is such a nice state in comparison to other states. It's like the, the government is willing to help the people effectively, uh, like myself, through uh, student programs and uh, special education. I thank you guys for that, continue that, and above all, strengthen it. Um, I would also like you, uh, uh, as my time is running down, uh, I would like to you guys to um, yeah, make government cool again. Uh, please. I'm, I'm so nervous, guys. You're doing a great job. You are thank doing you. a great job. Thank you. I haven't given up hope yet, and I hope you guys haven't either. If you guys have given up hope, then why are you here? I, I mean, if I see you guys here, and I know that since you guys are here and listening, I am grateful that you are helping out people either on the left or the right. Just stay away from the divisive issues and try to have some uh, uh, sensibility, uh, commonality within all of us. Just Please, I know I'm the last one, so um, yeah, do cool things like drive down the cost of education, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michelle Putko. Hi, I am here. I will always say I'm from Pittsfield, Massachusetts. It's where I was born and raised, and when I was 17, I left Massachusetts for 32 years, and I served active duty in the Army, and I convinced my, <laughs> I convinced my Yankee-loving husband to move back to Massachusetts with me. <laughs> That's true. And um, so I came to UMass Lowell for my next career, and I was at a national conference in Washington, D.C., listening to Gina McCarthy talk about Massachusetts and what Massachusetts is doing, how we're leading in efficiency, the carbon fee we were considering. And I said, I don't know anything about that. And I'm now back in the state. And part of the reason I came back to the state was because we do awesome things. And I started learning. Mark, I read your report. I read about the bills. I started talking to my students about them. 
I teach engineering, and they realize that we can't solve these problems with just equations and computers, that we need the social will, and some of my engineering students actually started writing letters, and this was from one student. I heard about the act to combat climate change and did some research about it in order to get a better understanding. It is indeed a great initiative. I do feel the need to express my concern about the time proposed in order to make it happen. The amount of the fee should not have to be introduced during such a long time. Climate change is a problem that doesn't allow for much time to go by without consequences. The more time we take to do something about it, the more we allow things to get worse. Statistics do not lie. We cannot just take five to 10 years, then carry out gradual phase-ins. And he goes on, I am in favor of this initiative. However, I think it should be one step. I certainly hope to hear more about progress taking place in this matter. I think this letter is two years old now. I, I saved some of them. And now is the time to be a leader in our whole country to be first. I don't think I'm going to hear the administrator of the EPA bragging about us, but we from Massachusetts are certainly going to brag about us, the people of Massachusetts. Thank you. Christopher Tribon. Hello. Hello. Um, presidents and senators, so um, <clears throat> I would have to say is, is that um, as a whole, we are not afraid, um, but we are pretty angry, I would say, as, as probably um, as a state. And so I wanted to bring three uh, it, pr prominent issues uh, to the front of it. And one, of, one was the, the support of the Sa uh, Safe Communities Act. And my reasoning behind this is, uh, to, to quote Ellie Wiesel, a uh, Holocaust survivor, is that no human being is illegal. And we, we should uh, um, stand, uh, stand by um, for, for, for the, the fact of our, of our history, our moral his, history. Um, the second thing that I would like to address, which uh, hasn't been really addressed in the room, is, is criminal justice reform. I'm part of the Black Student Union um, on campus. And one of the things that we were we actually had a meeting tonight about criminal justice reform and how once a convict is released from society and has, has paid his debt is, is that there's actually no way for him to advance in society and he just goes back to crime. So I'd like to see an act that would help uh, reform and get these people to actually instead be working productive citizens instead of just going back to crime until in, in the same kind of perpetuating uh, endless cycle. Uh, the next thing I would like to do is, is challenge you on t two things, is that people believe our government has lost accountability. And so I ask and I challenge you to be accountable um, when it comes to I issues of health care, criminal justice reform, or any, any type of issue that needs to be addressed uh, in the community. Um, and the third statement I would like to make is, is more of just, you know, a warning, and that is, is that if you do not support these issues, like this, support the Safe Communities Act, or healthcare reform, or other things, and you stand in the way of that, I will remember you when I go to the ballot box. Thank you, <laughs> Mara Snow. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Mara Snow. I'm a resident of Chelmsford since 1997. Four, my four sons all went to Chelmsford Public Schools, and three of the four graduated from various UMass institutions and one's from UMass Lowell. My two older grandchildren are now students in the Lowell Public Schools, where they are part of the microcosm that will be America of the future. As white kids, they are a racial minority, and they are warmly welcomed and accepted by all of the friends in their school, even though their skin is a different color. Their friends have names like Vishwa, Sapani, and Ganesh, what a great group of kids they are in the Lowell Public Schools. But what an education they're getting. It's good. Lowell does the best it can with the money that it has. We've talked about income inequality. When my grandkids' parents were in school in Chelmsford, we looked down the road at Concord and said, hmm, not really fair that if you live in Concord, you have more educational opportunities than if you live in Chelmsford. Now I look at my grandchildren, they have even less op educational opportunities than what their parents had in Chelmsford simply because they've chosen to live in Lowell because they love the diversity. 
and excellent education should be the birthright of every child born in Massachusetts or who moves here. Please, please do what you can so my grandkids and their friends have the exact same opportunities as the kids in Concord. Thank you. Thank you. Jay Mason. Thank you, President Rosenberg and distinguished Senators, I appreciate your time and I uh, applaud you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Jay Mason. I'm the chair of the Lowell Sustainability Council. I wish that we had more sustainability councils around the state, but there's no bill for that. So I am here to provide some support for a number of environmental bills. I feel very strongly uh, that we are uh, losing the opportunity nationally to do what we needed to do. But we still have time and we're still on the field. The clock is still ticking and I exercise my own energy and right to work with, with, with my elected officials and try to get some things happening, particularly uh, with the act uh, combating climate change. Um, Senator Barrett, your, uh, your bill 1821 is a terrific bill. Thank you for uh, sponsoring that. Uh, carbon pricing 2, H1726, the two pipeline tax bills that are uh, fighting to keep the uh, costs of, of developing pipelines off the backs of the, of the consumer, uh, H3400 and H2698. The RPS standard, uh, that, uh, uh, Senator Pacheco, um, that's, uh, that's your bill, thank you. Um, that uh, is an act relative to solar power and the green economy. That's a terrific idea. I think we need to be supporting these things so that we can move forward and make something happen while we, again, still have some time to do that. Uh, the gas leaks bill, uh, that was mentioned earlier tonight. The paint stewardship legislation, that was also mentioned. That, that saved uh, $12 million, uh, according to the uh, estimates from the um, uh, uh, in, impartial organization that put together a study on that. So I think in general, we need more sustainability uh, efforts going across nationally. And the only way we're going to get that to happen is if we work in our own backyard and get some things happening here. So I urge you to work with us. We will continue to work with you. I'm also a member of the uh, environmental group 350MA of Greater Lowell. We recently met with Senator Songus. We hope to continue to meet with all of you and work together. We've got some huge challenges and struggles, but I know we can accomplish it with your help. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Mannion. Hello, uh, my name is Tom Mannion. I live in Newburyport, and I'm here to ask that you support the Alimony Reform Act that's currently in the House. Uh, previously, the Chancellor spoke about challenges, hopes, and dreams. And like all of you, uh, I have challenges in my life. Some are trivial, some are devastating. Um, an example, Article 2 from my divorce agreement. Thomas Mannion shall pay my ex-wife the sum of $500 per week as alimony for as long as they both remain alive. Um, so this is a financial death sentence to me. So she said challenges, hopes, and dreams. I, there were some hopes that I had in the Alimony Reform Act because there was a retirement clause which would allow me to stop paying once I retired. Um, the first time that I went through the legislature, it passed unanimously in the House and Senate. And then the SJC overrode the act's intent. It went into the House last year, it passed unanimously, and it never went to the Senate for a vote. Um, as far as dreams, um, I would hope that someday I don't have to pay $500 per week for the rest of my life. Um, and so I am here to ask that you support the alimony reform bill that's currently in the House. Thank you. Thank you. Liz, Liz Hartman or Harriman? Which is it? I'm sorry. Harriman. Harriman. Great. Thank you for staying. I'm sure you're all exhausted. And so I'll be I'm real sure you all are too. <laughs> I'll be real brief. I just want to thank the Senate for always being supportive of environmental issues and public health and occupational health. Uh, you're, you're wonderful. Um, the state uh, certainly has some uh, backfilling to do in the next four years as, as our crippled EPA and other organizations, as others have said, uh, you know, aren't able to do their job. Um, 
Instead of what I was going to say, I just want, I was struck by the earlier younger speakers, and I want to encourage you to make sure that we're supporting organ, uh, agencies like the Department of Environmental Protection to a level that they can hire young professionals to build that capacity so that Massachusetts continues to be a leader in all those. As the rest of a certain age group retires, we really don't have enough budgets in those agencies to uh, build new capacity. So. Uh, I think there's a, a good candidate right out there that just spoke to you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Laura Ortiz. Laura Ortiz. Okay. How about um, Cindy Lup Lupis? Lup Lupi. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cindy Lupi. I'm the New England Director for Clean Water Action. And I can't tell you um, how proud I am to be from Massachusetts tonight. Um, I'm proud of the, the democracy uh, on display. I'm proud of your leadership. Um, I'm proud of the, the really um, inspiring discussion that we're having tonight. Uh, so thank you. Um, Clean Water Action is a multi-issue environmental group, um, and I want to start off by thanking you all, um, and Senate uh, President, President Rosenberg, thank you so much for uh, supporting the passage through the Senate unanimously of the uh, toxic flame retardant bill that, that uh, passed last session that would protect firefighters and children. Uh, from, from, from dangerous chemicals that we know we can uh, replace with safer alternatives. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, uh, the, the coalition is back at it again this year and uh, we're, we're encouraged by, uh, by your leadership last session and uh, the House is, uh, is mobilizing uh, this session. Um, so thank you. Uh, we also obviously care deeply about climate change and clean energy and I want to thank Senator Pacheco for everything that he's doing and, and all of us um, for really thinking carefully about how we can move forward as a state in a way that fits our values, uh, wanting to see us really hit our climate change mandates, wanting to make sure that low income and moderate income families are not uh, overly burdened wanting to make sure that we provide a beacon of hope for other states who are uh, looking to us for leadership. So uh, you know, thank you for all of the, the, the bills that, that have been introduced, supported by the Mass Power Forward Coalition. Um, I want to particularly focus on Senator Barrett's uh, carbon pricing bill, um, and I want to do it here at UMass Lowell because of the leadership of amazing professors like uh, Professor Michelle Putko, who you just heard from, um, she organized and co-sponsored a, a public forum with us last year that focused on the, the tools in carbon pricing that actually grow a clean tech economy. Uh, we really looked at the experience of Vancouver in British Columbia and how they attracted 50% more clean tech businesses after they passed their policy. Um, there's just such tremendous power in innovation and leading by example here in the Commonwealth. Um, we're very excited that there's a House a bill also moving, so there's leadership in the House this session, um, which will complement the, you know, the great discussions that you all are having. Uh, we just really want to help be a partner in these efforts, be a resource, and thank you. Thank you for, for having these really serious debates and discussions without a lot of e easy answers. Thank you very much. Really Thanks. Thank you. Really letting democracy thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're down to, uh, we're going to recognize the last individual who signed up to testify. But before um, the last speaker speaks, um, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone uh, to please participate in the online survey, malegislature.gov slash cc, and to let you know that the two issues that have been voted the most on tonight are climate change and affordable housing. Um, and I'm also going to ask, uh, or just let everyone know that have, even if you haven't spoken, if you do want to sign in, 
with your email so that when we do complete these Commonwealth Conversations tour, we'd be happy to email you a copy of the report of the tour. And at the conclusion of this session, uh, a year and a half or so from now, uh, the report that we will compile to see how the legislative actions that we've taken, how it's married what we've heard uh, on this Commonwealth conversation. Thank you. So, um, I'm sorry. I didn't get to go on the list, and I didn't realize you had to be on a list. Okay. So, how many did, did weren't able to register? I would ask that I could. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fine. So, what we're going to do? What I will do is call the last um, name that did register, Glenn, and it looks like Greer. Is Glenn here? I'm sorry. Okay. And then, if you can come up one by one, identify yourself. Um, You've waited a long time, so we will we will hear from you. Good evening. Thank you for your patience tonight. Thank you for all coming. Uh, I have two things. One that hasn't been spoken of yet tonight that I have a strong feeling on, as you can see when I sign on. I'm a member of Wolfpack. Uh, many of you have sp are co-sponsored and sponsored on free and fair elections, finally and forever getting money out of politics with a constitutional amendment state by state. Now, it's always started that way, but once the federal government gets the idea that, hey, they're serious, they usually do it themselves. But we've got to get the train moving to get that moving forward. Uh, the second one, and I know many of you are on that one, the second one is more specifically aimed towards my wife. She's a teacher here in Lowell, and this year and this year alone, we've put in $1,400 into her classroom. Last year, we put in nearly 2500 with no reimbursement from the state. Now the federal government has a little bit of reimbursement, but for the sheer number of amount that we're putting into her classroom to help her students, it's just, it's not sustainable for us. And we don't know if we can do this again next year. But we're doing all we can, and I know you're all doing all you can, especially with the cuts that look like they're coming. I'd like to see if there's something we can do to fully fund classrooms. I mean, we don't need a $10,000 computer in every classroom. A $500, $500 computer in the classrooms will do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So, ma'am, if you'll come up. Thank you. Um, I'm Renee D'Argento, and I'm from Pepperell. Thank you for being here. Hello. Um, I want to echo uh, and hope you support um, these environmental bills. I didn't plan on speaking on that. Um, but um, uh, Jamie Eldridge is 100% renewable by 2050, and what I call the bundle of bills that get us there, um, uh, the, the cap that you want to, um, uh, uh, the cap and trade, or not cap and trade, but you know what I'm talking about, the carbon pricing and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, but I wanted to speak on health care, um, Medicare for all, another one of Jamie's bills. Um, I'd like to read something. The UN states that health is a fundamental right indispensable for the exercise of other human rights. Every human being is entitled to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health conducive to living a life of dignity. Um, and there are key principles around this. We've been tinkering around the edges of access, universality, um, uh, transparency and equity in healthcare, um, and uh, basically, um, the way our healthcare system is now, even in Massachusetts, as good as it has been with Obamacare, um, healthcare is still inequitable. The fact that um, you know people people status change, um, they lose their jobs, uh, they become um, they become sick and unhealthy. They have to constantly, uh, every year, there are changes in health care that make you go to another health care insurance program. You have to change your primary care doctor. There's a lot of fragmentation in the health care system. Um, it has issues with um, uh, uh, the standard of care as far as preventive care and, um, and that sort of thing. So um, 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 let's see. It's just inherently inequitable, and I hope that you consider the Medicare for All Act um, because I think that will help with that, and also will help reduce costs if everybody is covered, and we don't have to keep on, you know, going through this changes with the insurance. Thank you. Thank you. If the ma'am would you come forward? Hi. Thank you. Hello. I'm here to talk about the um, Alimony Reform Act. 
I'm actually going to ask your, beg you, to not. I'm a, I'm against it. Um, I think divorce. There's no winners in a divorce. Divorce is sad. While I sympathize with some of the men and the issues they've had, I the issue I have is making it uh, retroactive. So it's affecting women that have been divorced almost 20 years and that are now in their 60s and they're going to be destitute. There are men that I personally know of that make over a million dollars a year and they're taking wives back to court under this law just because they can and the women are destitute. So what is the state going to do with women in their 60s that this law has allowed the men to stop alimony that are now destitute? Who's going to support them? The women that have raised their children have forsaken their career so these husbands can climb the corporate ladder and have their career. I don't, th I think the law, I sympathize with the men. I'm not sure this law, how can it just protect the men and, and be against the women with durational limits and say it doesn't matter? Um, yeah, there are, there are judges, there's a clause that judges can deviate, but judges, there, some are, some aren't. Um, I know two cases just went to the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of, of the retroactive, making it retroactive. These people that have been divorced almost 20 years, the husbands signed this agreement not once but twice when the kids became emancipated when they first got divorced. So how do they, uh, the law change and all of a sudden they can say, yay, there's a new law, let's just go to court and stop alimony. I'm not sure it's constitutional for these poor women that are going to be on the streets. And I feel for the men. I'm, I'm not sure that maybe it can't be revised to somehow protect those men that can't afford, rightfully can't afford alimony when they're retired. But I don't think it should be a blanket durational limit that, that men that can well afford it can just get out of it and leave people destitute. I, I think there should be a compromise somewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're, well, I'll get there. Uh, sir, if you could come forward. And I see there's someone back there. We'll call you next. I'll call you by your name, but I don't know it. So <laughs> forgive my pointing. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. English is my fourth language, so excuse my words if I'm not good at that. My name is Mohammed Arif, and uh, I came from uh, Pakistan. I'm a great student in chemical engineering. Uh, here is my first semester is my third month here. Um, and uh, actually, it was my dream. I, I dreamed 12 years for this, and I planned to be in a great institute and uh, done my graduation from uh, some renowned institutes. Uh, I'm concerned about the biggest issue that um, uh, usually we have summer breaks. Uh, so we go to home, our home country. My parents are 75 years old. So if something's unusual, God forbid, happens, uh, or I just want to meet with them. So who will protect me that when I arrive again, the, and the US official will not detain me in an airport? I don't know anyone here. There's no single fin uh, family member uh, here to protect me. I don't know if this issue is concerned with you or not, but I'm really uh, feeling fear. I'm kind of afraid that after a semester, two semesters, if I go to country, I have spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and when I came back, who are going, uh, going to support me? And who, who is going to protect me for that, that uh, US officials will not detain me, as uh, the great Muhammad Ali son has even uh, de uh, detained on an airport. Uh, and despite all the fact, I'm very thankful to the world people. Every person is very welcoming. I love your uh, culture, your society. I'm getting in, and I'm loving it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am. That's my shadow. She'll be louder over there than she will be here. So. Hi. Thanks for spending the extra time to listen to us. Um, before I, I start with, with my whole thing, I just wanted to say uh, the, the number one epidemic that's happening in our state is the heroin crisis and the overdoses that are happening. I can support everybody's thoughts on global climate change and, and the things that will happen in the foreseeable future or the distant future, but this is happening right now. Um, our babies and my friends are dying 
yesterday, Tewksbury, I mean, there's only 25,000 25, of us in our town. I don't even know. Another, another graduate of mine from 1995, gone. They're people are dropping like flies. It is an epidemic. It is the, the bill that Baker signed last January with all the fanfare. Where is that? What's happening? Where's the $250,000 that were earmarked for our treatment center? We need help. We need beds. We need help for these people who have this absolute disease. And please stop the stigma, everybody. Okay, so anyway, back to what I'm doing here <clears throat> in addition to that is I'm a woman, obviously. I'm a small business owner. I own two mom and pop ice cream stores, one in Billerica and one just a few blocks down the street on Pawtucket Street, 500 Pawtucket Street, Orchard Hill Ice Cream. I am the very definition of a small business owner. I don't have an employee match 401k. I don't have a pension. <clears throat> I don't have an employee who helps me pay my health care benefits. Um, my children, my four kids, they qualify for the Children's and Medical, Medical Security Plan, so clearly you guys know that I'm not millionaires. Um, but my husband and I pay $787.34 34 per month for our plan, and that's after a $4,000 deductible. I beg of you, <clears throat> uh, please give me one more minute, please, as well as the residents in this room to understand my side on the minimum wage debate. I sell ice cream, and my store down the street sells ice cream to our friends in the acre, who I know Eileen understands. Many pay with nickels and pennies just to buy their kids a small slush. I charge $3.95. How many times are you going to come up to my window and pay more than $3.95 for two scoops of ice cream? I can only raise my prices so much, and I refuse to raise my prices to my neighbors down the road. They're destitute. I refuse to do it. So my kids' sports, my kids' activities, and the extras that we want to do, like going to Disney World this year, got cut. I can't do it because my salary, my husband's salary shrink. I support minimum wage increase. I do. I just support it differently. And I don't understand how difficult it would be to have two separate minimum wages in this state. Those who file for as head of household or claim others as dependent on their taxes versus those who I hire, primarily 15, 16, and 17-year-old kids who maybe pay for their iPhone bill. And those social security numbers who get claimed as dependents on somebody else's taxes. I support those moms, the 42-year-old mom with the kids, the single moms. I get it. I get that. But you cannot be fight for 15 and also be a proponent of small businesses. It's impossible to do that because as a small business owner, you're killing us. You're not killing the corporations that you want to hurt. They don't care. They'll go automated. You can see it with McDonald's and their kiosks. They will adjust. I will close. My doors have been open for its 20th season in Blurica. And although Kevin Donnelly's not here, I'm sure he can attest that there's not many businesses left in Blurica that can say that they've opened their doors for 20 years in a row. And Eileen, I am open in my ninth season down the street, in the acre. Doesn't happen. No, thank and you, Barry. you Baron. know my mom, Karen, who's been in business downtown. I do know her very well. For decades. Well. Yeah. I'm begging you guys to consider. It's as simple as social security numbers go in, dependent, right. not dependent, bam, two separate minimum wages. Thank you. That's what I asked Thank you for. very much. Thank you. And we had someone down back who had their hand raised. And I believe that's the... Oh, we have two, two more. Okay. If you could come forward. Yes, I'm sorry. The head was already in, in here. That's okay. Hi, I'm Karen and Cirillo, and I'm, uh, I'm from Lowell. And I want to thank you all for tonight, and I greatly appreciate meeting with you. Um, Massachusetts was rated number one state in the United States, so hooray us. We're doing a fantastic job, and it's thanks to everyone in the state. Um, I also want to say that we're very progressive, we're very, um, we're very artistic, and we're very, um, we innovate. And I just wanted to say that if you could continue to supporting the arts, 
because I think that they're so important. They're so very important because arts, art goes along with science, just like music goes along with math. I mean, they're all intertwined and it's so important for our children to be able to have these programs. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Ma'am, down back, if you'll come forward. And I believe this is our last speaker of the night. Did I miss anyone? Oh, one more over here, okay. And Hi. Hi. My name is Dawn Murphy. My parents moved to Massachusetts Bedford, Mass. in 1967. Um, we had a neighbor who decided a black family in my neighborhood and circulated a petition to try to keep us from moving in. Now, I, I am thankful to say that most of my family's experience in Bedford has been phenomenal. It's a great school system. When um, I, I'm in the military, fourth generation military. Um, can't convince my daughters to follow me, but <laughs> Um, I've lived across the country, I've lived in Korea, and I can definitely say that the, one of the best things in the world is having been raised in America, having lived in Korea, and Korea is a, I love Korea, but it's not America. There's a lot of things that we do absolutely right. One of them is this, we can talk, we can debate, we can vote, we can protest. We can do all of that. And having been raised in Massachusetts, especially Bedford Mass, and the education I got, and the education my children are getting, I know, having talked with other people, that we are superb. One of my daughters graduated from Tulane, and she, um, I, the majors now are so confusing to me, but basically it was foreign uh, relations. She's now going through the process of becoming a translator at the UN. And a lot of that was because of the language training and the other training she got here in Bedford, Mass. Um, my other daughter is um, going to be studying STEM. We do so many things right. Earlier, a young man said that we shouldn't be getting into the divisive issues. I'm sorry, go back to our American history. We had the rebels versus the Tories. That is our history, that is who we are. We cannot fix problems if we're not willing to get our hands dirty and, and, and talk and work our way through the issues. We are who we are because of who our ancestors in this country were. We came and we said, we want to be independent from the British, and we are. And through a, a whole series of trying to live up to the Bill of Rights, the Constitutions, and so forth, we have progressed. You know, in a marriage, you can't have the marriage survive if you don't develop, talk, debate, discuss, work through those divisive issues. You can't progress ever if you're not willing to have those hard conversations. And I want to thank the people of this state and my representatives who are not fearful of saying, we have issues, we're not going to ignore them. One of the young ladies earlier talked I'm about- sorry, oh, but sorry. thank okay. you. Thank you very much for your testimony. You. We do have one more. Thank you so much for listening and staying. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank I'm you. here for um, the protection of the medically fragile children of the uh, state of Massachusetts. And I know that uh, President Rosenberg has had the opportunity to meet with mothers who are leading a family campaign. Um, their three primary issues are that Mass Health has uh, medically necessary approved hours of care that is needed and we as providers are unable to fulfill 24% of those hours, which means that 47 of the patients have less than fully coverage uh, nursing care. Um, it takes 19 weeks 
for a provider to find enough nurses to fill these shifts. And that number is, uh, had, has come about in the last year and a half. Um, the average uh, continuous skilled nursing wage is $30.50 an hour when we're competing with UMass Medical Center that pays the nurses $55.30 or Northeast Hospital that pays $49.15 an hour. So access to highly skilled nursing is, uh, we're not able to compete. Right now, um, the home care industry can uh, attract one in every four nurse. And um, with the, we're asking for an increase in the reimbursement to $13.75 per hour, we would be able to compete with 50% of the nurses and, and keep these families at home, together at home. Uh, so on behalf of the 916 families, that are caring for their uh, children at home uh, that are severely handicapped and ventilator dependent. Uh, I would ask for you to continue to support our efforts and um, make uh, pediatric nursing care a priority when it comes to the budget. Uh, Senator Jim Timoley has introduced the um, Bill um, 1273, and I know the majority of the, your panel today supports it, and I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that concludes our, thank you very much. I'm going to, um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming out here tonight, for hanging in there with us. Um, all of your input was so incredibly valuable. I'm going to turn this over for closing remarks to the Senate President. Thank you. Stay in touch with us. Watch what we do. You will see your fingerprints on our agenda. Have a good night.